tonight. A guilty plea in connection with a Saskatoon private Christian school at the center of historical sexual assault and abuse allegations and charges. Also, Regina veterinarians are teaming up to offer overnight and on-call care as the city struggles with a workforce shortage. Plus, it's very much about making sure that everybody feels comfortable. All kinds of reaction after Hockey Canada introduces new rules about change rooms for the upcoming season. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Thursday, October 5th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for watching. A former coach at the Christian Centre Academy in Saskatoon is admitting he sexually assaulted a teen student at the private Christian school. Aaron Benawise pleaded guilty today in provincial court to several sex-related charges. Benawise entered the pleas by phone from Edmonton, but his victim came to court in Saskatoon. Dan Zakreski brings us the story. Jennifer Beaudry was 13 when the offences began. A different person came to court today. I grew up, I was a kid at the time, but I grew up, I remember the details. This is absolutely not okay by any means and it's time for some accountability to happen. Accountability came today when Aaron Benawise pleaded guilty to sexual exploitation and sexual assault. In an email to CBC, he says that he takes responsibility for the highly inappropriate relationship he had with a teenage athlete. Beaudry said Benawise began making eyes at her when she was a young teen involved in track and volleyball. Now this behavior escalated over years to secret meetups and sexual touching. She says she decided to come forward with her story after CBC Saskatchewan published an investigation in August of 2022 into the school. Benawise is one of three former officials at the school facing criminal charges. Two former principals at the school are facing a combined total of 23 counts of assault with a weapon. Both are scheduled to be in court next week. Beaudry says she's waited years for today. He spent a long time denying facts that he knows to be true, running from accountability and responsibility. So to see him have to step up to the plate and face his demons and say, yes, I am guilty of this, felt really, really good. I know that there's a lot of people in my shoes that don't get this opportunity. Aaron Benawise returns to court January 4th for sentencing. Dan Zakreski, CBC News, Saskatoon. Saskatoon police now say there was no risk to staff, students or anyone after a death in a parking lot near a high school early this morning. Officers were called to this lot near Bedford Road Collegiate around 7.30 this morning for reports of a dead body. Police say the death is not considered suspicious, but the coroner service will be investigating. The Transportation Safety Board says it was a broken rail that led to a fiery derailment near Guernsey in 2019 that spilled millions of litres of oil. This was the aftermath when a CP train carrying oil from Alberta to Oklahoma went off the rails near the small community. No one was hurt, but 20 tank cars breached and released oil. The resulting inferno burned for more than 24 hours. The TSB says the section of the rail that caused the crash likely failed under a previous train. Residents of a Regina Lutheran care home are uncertain about their future. The operator wants to close by next spring and wants the Saskatchewan Health Authority to take over management during the transition. But the SHA says that won't happen. The NDP is calling on the province to step in and keep the facility open. 62 residents live there and more than 100 people work at the home. Dawn Gunderson's wife is a resident at Regina Lutheran and says it's an eight-minute drive to visit her every day. She was bounced to a couple of nursing homes before and I just it just breaks my heart to see her losing her home and her family because this is her home and this is her this is their family in there. That's all I have to say. Thank you. The union that represents staff at the care home says the province has failed its seniors. QP 5430 says wait lists for long-term care are already too long and this will have a ripple effect on hospitals and other facilities. 
Like elsewhere across Canada, Saskatchewan continues to deal with a veterinary shortage. The latest example is in Regina, where the city's 24-hour animal hospital didn't have enough staff to cover the overnight shift. But as Jesse Anton reports, it didn't take long for other clinics to pitch in. We really felt obligated to try and do something. When Dr. Tracy Fisher and other veterinarians from across Regina found out the city's 24-hour animal hospital could no longer staff its overnight shift, they all stepped up to share the load. Eleven local vet clinics are now on a rotation that provides on-call emergency care between 8 at night and 8 in the morning. We need you to call into your vet clinic first and then you're going to be directed uh, to a triage service and they're going to determine whether or not you need to see a vet that night. Um, and then if they determine that yes, you do need to see a vet, they're going to direct you to the clinic and the veterinarian that is on call for that evening. Worst case scenario, Fisher says Regina Vets might be able to transfer patients up to the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in Saskatoon. But that team is also swamped. The college's dean says the this speaks to the nationwide veterinary shortage. It emphasizes to us that we really do need, need to graduate more veterinarians in this country. Muir says the vet college has increased its student seats in recent years, but the school is now at capacity. It's working on a feasibility study to see what's needed to expand the program. In the meantime, she says the industry is leaning on internationally trained vets. The Saskatchewan government says it also recognizes the struggles with recruitment and retention, and soon it plans to announce incentives for more vets to work here. Dora, can you sit? That's a good call. Back at the clinic, Fisher says she hopes more vets are on the way. But for now... We're going to do the best we can with what we got, and, and it's, it's going to be okay. Jesse Anton, CBC News, Regina. The world of Canadian minor hockey is mulling over Hockey Canada's new guidelines. Players must arrive with their game underwear already on and leave that way too. The move is aimed at inclusion. Kayla Hounsel looks at the reaction so far. It is Canada's game, but not always, not for everyone. Now a new policy aimed at making hockey more inclusive. I understand that we can no longer get naked in the dressing rooms. We have to wear a bottom layer. Hockey Canada's new dressing room policy states that all minor hockey players should wear shorts, t-shirts or sports bras at all times. Until now, players have had the option of stripping down to change in and out of their gear. I don't think it affects me in any way, but it, it, I, I, I have to like think about the people around me and how they feel. So. LGBTQ advocates say it's a significant step forward. I think the, the concept of belonging really is a big, huge development factor. We see that, especially with young youth, that they are leaving sports because they aren't feeling comfortable. The hope is to level the playing field when it comes to gender identity, religious beliefs and body image concerns. But the policy is intended to help everyone. We have girls that may want to go into a dressing room with boys and up to this time, they've had to be in their own room. So they're not really part of the team per se. The new policy also applies to showering. When using open concept showers like these, athletes are encouraged to use a private bathroom first to change out of their base layer and into swimwear before getting in. I understand, but at the same time, I think it's a little silly. And I don't know if it's necessarily sanitary to wear a bathing suit in the shower. Some are concerned about inconvenience. Others point out during the COVID-19 pandemic, players were required to show up fully dressed. Lots of adaptations, and, and we rolled with it, um, and we rose to it. And advocates say understanding the intent behind this move will lead to even more progress. Go out, work hard, and have fun. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Dartmouth. The province of Saskatchewan will be honouring one of the greatest players to wear the green and white this weekend. Today, Premier Scott Moe declared that Saturday, October 7th, will be George Reed Day in Saskatchewan. He was a team player in every sense of the word. It was never about George. It was always about the team and his adopted province of Saskatchewan, and I would say more specifically, the people. Uh, that resided in his adopted province of Saskatchewan and we were so fortunate uh, that he adopted us. He was one of those people that loved contributing and giving and being as selfless and as effective as he could. He would always say if you want something done give it to somebody who's really busy. 
And at one point in time, he was busy enough where he was part of 47 different charities and still was able to come and hang out at my swim meets and do all kinds of other things. A book of condolences has been set up in the legislative main foyer and it will stay there until the end of next week. People can also sign it tomorrow at Reed's Celebration of Life at the International Trade Center. Now this coming weekend will be bittersweet for Ryder fans. A number of fan favorites from the 2013 Grey Cup winning team are back for the game against the Ticats on Saturday. They will be honored along with Reed on Legends Night before being inducted into the Plaza of Honor. That season was just, ah, it was special. From the moment the coaches put that team together and we looked around in the locker room, like you could say like, we could do something here and, and possibly be great and become legends. And we went out there and did it. You have to go through it to really explain what we're feeling inside. Um, but it, it's something that I haven't felt since, you know. So it's uh, it was such a special group and to be able to, have these on for the rest of our lives and our names etched on the on the cup forever. That's you know that's the ultimate goal and that's the, the best part of it. Being a a player with the Riders, man, you and the fans literally just embrace you with open arms. Mm -hmm. You know, and I always talk about from the day I got here, I just felt that. You know, and then to be able to do something so remarkable here in the hometown of Regina, where the team is, you know, where the team is, where a lot of the fans were pretty much born and raised. You know, it's. How can you not have that be the most memorable time in your life, you know? And as an athlete, you don't win championships very often. It's very, very difficult, no matter what level you play on, to win a championship. And for us to do it on a professional level in a special time like this, and, and it, it, it's, it's amazing. You, it's, you'll never forget it. Some gorgeous new public art in downtown Saskatoon. This mural is called Moving Forward and it was recently completed by Métis artist Kent Ness. It depicts two Plains Cree riders on horseback moving across the grasslands with a prairie sunset in the background. There's also some culturally significant wildflowers on the border. You can find the mural on the corner of 20th Street and 1st Avenue South. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. A new book titled My People, My Family is celebrating the writing of Indigenous university students. They all took a creative writing program as part of the U of S Indian teacher education program. Jason Warwick has their story. Mika LaFond and Bill Robertson met 20 years ago at the University of Saskatchewan. At that time, the single mom of two was enrolled in the Indian Teacher Education Program. She decided to take Robertson's creative writing class. Students were encouraged to write about their lives, many for the first time. Creating that community of like support is really important. And in the creative writing class, when you share something personal in your writing, um, there's automatically a connection made with somebody who hears it and says, oh, I'm not the only one that's going through this in life. Now, LaFond is an ITEP instructor completing her doctoral degree and Robertson is retired. But they've teamed up once again to co-edit a new anthology. It compiles several years of writing from students who took the class. I know that this opens all kinds of doors for our students, but also it's a safe space for sharing your voice um, as an Indigenous student. A number of the poems, as I say in my introduction, were written in the shadow of the well, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry in the reconciliation talks in the, the whole Colton Bushy shooting. All those kind of things were happening as these students were writing these pieces. Robertson says he's learned a lot from the students and from LaFond, who's a member of the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation. It's been a joyous experience. Um, what, what we wanted to do was create a safe space for First Nations students to tell their stories, the, the, who they are, what they are, what they're going through, what they've gone through. The book, titled My Family, My People, launches next Wednesday evening at McNally Robinson Bookstore in Saskatoon. LaFond and Robertson hope it will inspire a new generation of Indigenous youth to find their voice. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Saskatoon. This weather update is brought to you by Capital GMC Buick Cadillac, Truck Mania, is on now.
And our weather specialist, Ethan Williams, joins me now. I need you to do me a favor. What's that, Sam? I need you to take your weather magic mm -hmm. and bibbity bop the wind out of here because, oh my God. Bib oh my God. Bibbity bop the wind. Okay, yep. well, I'll, uh, I'll consider that. Uh, and yes, I think I can, I can do you that favor because, yeah, it has been incredibly windy through the province today. We're talking about sustained winds, not gusts, sustained winds upwards of 60 kilometers an hour. When they gust that high, that's a windy day. But we've seen gusts in western sections of the province uh, close to and in excess of 80 kilometers an hour from the northwest. Those very cool northwesterly winds combining with that cool air and yes we are getting some wet snow as well this was between uh larange and waskasu this morning on highway 2 near wayakwin uh around 11 30 and that has been falling through the province even right now radars having just a little bit of trouble discerning if this is rain or snow that's falling at the moment and i wouldn't be surprised if we're seeing a few flakes in there around both regina and saskatoon at the moment because temperatures still very cool really province-wide there's not a whole lot of deviation from from where kind of everyone is right now. In fact, Regina, this is the first day we haven't gotten above the 10 degree mark since April 24th. So it has been quite a while since we've seen this uh, kind of cool air. And temperatures just going to continue to drop. And that's why western sections of south and central are now under a special weather statement. And this means that there will likely be a very damaging frost tonight because temperatures likely to get to the minus 4 to minus 8 range. A little bit late season for uh, kind of these temperatures to be uh, coming around or for this kind of first real damaging frost of the fall and with the wind yes we could even see a little bit of a wind chill tonight around minus 10 or so is what it may feel like now you notice eastern sections not under that advisory and that's because conditions are a bit cloudier and that cloud kind of acts as a blanket kind of keeping us a bit warm overnight but it does mean that the precipitation that we see falling could indeed fall as a little bit of some mixed uh, rain and snow or even just some flurries, but not looking for any widespread significant moisture from that, thankfully. Tomorrow, things starting to clear through south and central. The north, less moisture, but still cloudy. And then we get to Saturday, this next low pressure system moving through, trending mostly rain in northern Saskatchewan. I think it'll be warm enough for the rain, uh, maybe not changing over to snow. And then Saturday, things becoming a little less eventful. Uh, and uh, we're seeing the those systems starting to move out. And the winds will start to die down too. Don't worry about that. Uh, we're seeing those still northwest gusts overnight tonight causing those wind chills at times. A little bit breezy through Friday and Saturday but definitely not as strong uh, as we saw today, for sure. Now, in terms of the extended outlook for Regina, tomorrow our temperature is improving. A little bit windy in the morning before that dies off, but we will see clearing. Gorgeous for the Ryder game on Saturday. Look at that, 20 degrees. Really, the whole Thanksgiving weekend looking quite nice as well. Those overnight lows staying above the freezing mark, even as our temperatures kind of return to normal values when we talk about daytime highs. And Saskatoon, yeah, you might just crack the 10-degree mark once again uh, tomorrow before possibly getting to 20 degrees on Sunday. Guess I should have moved that turkey over. It's actually Sunday when Thanksgiving <laughs> is, not Monday. But how about that, Sam? A Ryder game where you may not need a jacket. You're going to, that's bibbity bopping. Yeah. Well, you I, and your I weather work magic. My magic. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. You bet. Well, as we get further into fall, the e scooter pilot projects in Saskatchewan's two biggest cities will slowly wind up operations, depending on the weather, of course. The city of Regina is already looking for feedback on how the program went from now until October 22nd. You can weigh in at regina.ca slash e scooters. Responses will be compiled with data from the scooter companies, the police and the SHA to inform a city council report early next year. 51,259 trips were taken on e-scooters in Regina through July and August, traveling more than 130,000 kilometers. We'll be back after the break. When it comes to your news, you want up to the minute access. Anytime, anywhere. Get the facts straight from the source. Download the free CBC News app or visit cbcnews.ca for news you can trust. The federal government has announced results from last month's meetings with the heads of major grocery chains. The goal? Find ways to ease food prices. The federal industry minister outlined a series of steps the top five chains will be taking, some within days. Starting soon, Canadians will be able to see rollout of actions 
such as discount across a basket of food products, uh, price freezes, and price matching campaigns, to name a few. The government says if stores don't act, it will. Also announced today was a grocery task force to monitor prices and pricing practices in the works, as well as a grocery code of conduct, which is aimed at promoting what the government calls fairness and transparency. It's a measure of the impact of current interest rates on household debt. A growing proportion of Canadians now see monthly payments eaten up entirely by interest, making no progress toward paying off the mortgage. Philippe de Montigny reports. Le, la balance, le paiement. Michael Girard Courti has a variable rate mortgage for his duplex. Because of his fixed payments, the portion going to interest ballooned. Last month, he only paid $23 towards the principal and more than $1,100 in interest. I wasn't happy when I saw that. At first, I thought it was uh, actually a, a mistake. The time it will take to pay off his mortgage nearly doubled from 25 to 47 years. He worries another rate hike would push him into what's called negative amortization, a situation where his monthly payment isn't enough to cover all of the interest owed, meaning his mortgage would actually grow month after month. Instead of my instead of paying it off, well, I'm going to get just in more in more debt. This is already the case for about 20% of residential mortgages at three big banks, TD, BMO and CIBC. These negatively amortizing loans amount to more than $128 billion. It shouldn't be allowed. Uh, I know that most lenders w in this situation, what they do is uh, they increase your payment. The three banks tell CBC News their clients can refinance their loan, pay out a lump sum, or increase their monthly payments, but many can't afford it. It's an alarming situation considering the times that we're in right now. Canada's superintendent of financial institutions says $250 billion worth of mortgages have had their amortization period extended beyond 35 years. I think both banks, financial institutions and borrowers would be better off um, if the prevalence of this product was less. The bank regulator plans to crack down on negatively amortizing loans to rein in the risk faced by lenders and their clients. It plans to update its rules and guidelines later this month. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. And Ethan is back with one last look at your weather. Mm, chilly tonight uh, for sure in a lot of the province. And Regina, I think we'll see the best chance for, again, those showers or maybe a few flurries uh, before the midnight hours. Then things clearing. But you notice those winds still very strong. Uh, dying down a little bit as we head into the morning. That's the good news there. But we will be at the freezing mark at 8 a.m. Temperatures increasing to around uh, 5 or so by the noon hour. Still northwest winds and still a little bit breezy here and there, but otherwise should uh, start to see things clear out. For Saskatoon, yeah, I have put the wind chill on there for you. About minus 5, it's going to feel like at midnight, and it may feel even cooler than that at times overnight. And still feeling that way, we're in the negative temperatures by 8 a.m., but again, you're seeing that sunshine, and that should be sticking around. Those temperatures definitely bumping up as we head into the noon hour. So one more day of some single-digit temperature, Sam, but those 20s are not far away. Can't wait. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. And that is it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can head to cbc.ca slash sask, subscribe to the CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel, or download the CBC News app on your mobile device. Ethan and I will be back with more local news and weather tonight at 11. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night. Stay warm.